Hey guys, my name's Troy Hoffman. I'm the founder of Simplaris and the founder of Balance Genics and an executive mentor. What we do every week here is we're creating these things called fireside chats. We basically transform this entire space into a studio every week. Four, three. In the house today, we've got Walt Tomolina. Today in the studio, we have Ty Cannon. He's also one of the top anti-aging doctors in the country and probably even in the world. And what I want you to see is the opportunity to be exposed to all these different entrepreneurs, all these different people that can share their wisdom and insights because one idea can change your life today. They want to be part of the outcome, but they don't necessarily want to be part of the process because it's scary. And if they hear you say collision and they're afraid of conflict, I gotta there, go to the restroom, yeah, yeah. I'm out of here. I'm out of here, yes, <laughs> they've done that. I realize there's over 27 different hormones and hormone metabolites that exert a tremendous effect on your body, your mind, your performance, and whether you live or you die. You can actually like, like apply something to that. Oh, absolutely. I won't certify somebody unless they know what they're doing. Yeah. The big question in teaching NLP is, how do you utilize these astonishing tools with somebody who knows nothing about their mind? Never heard they had a mind. How do you do that? How do you bring them up to speed so that they can make a change? That's a yeah. big problem. And so consequently, when I'm teaching a class of people becoming practitioners, I know what works. I know precisely what works and what doesn't work. Utilizing these tools that I learned out of the world of NLP, I also created a lot of those tools in NLP. I want to be sure that it's authentic. One new concept, one new thing you can take back to your workplace, one new thing you can take back to your company, one new thing you can take back to your family to change the way you think and see and change everything about what you're doing and the actions you're going to take. All right, folks, welcome back to the Fireside Chats. Today in the house, we have Dr. Robert D. McDonald. And I'm really actually super excited about today because this is one of the rare moments to actually learn from someone who's actually lived, practiced, and learned beyond most people you will ever meet in a lifetime of how to functionally live this life. And I, and I don't mean that lightly. Like you can spend your whole life trying to get to a level of, of understanding of how life really works that Dr. Robert D. McDonald has actually gotten to and can help transform people's lives. He's like the, the living reality of, of someone that can actually create transformation, not just teach on stage, but actually he's been working on people for over 50 years now, working with people, learning, creating true transformation in people's lives, was running men's groups in the early 70s, uh, was one of the original people that was working in the field of NLP before they even labeled it almost NLP, and, and back in the, in the mid 70s. And, and his life is amazing. He's got his doctorate in divinity. He's got, he's got all, so many different education and so many different realms and worked in so many different areas. It's kind of hard to fathom. And one of the most impressive things for me is like, I've been around the best of the best. I get around on a regular basis. I pay the most money I possibly can, to hang out with the top coaches, the top mentors, anywhere and find out who's doing what, reading their books, seeing what's going on, but they have bits, they have pieces. They don't have the full picture of really how do we live this life so we feel that we're a success. We feel that our life is going in a great direction. We feel good about ourselves. We feel good about our, our bodies. We feel good about our health. We, we are transforming the life that we want to live and intentionally choosing that which we want. And that's one of the things I've learned by work, working with Dr. Robert here is how do I choose what I want? Where am I going to intentionally go with my life? And how does the mind really work? This is a, this is a very limited opportunity in a series of, of shows we're going to create over a period of time, trying to, trying to glean from this man the wisdom of, of literally decades and decades of really deep, intelligent work because of the motivation he had to ease the pain and suffering he was going through and ease the suffering of the world. Catch this, folks. The pain he went through has produced a possibility of the present that he is living in now because he learned how to ease his own suffering. He's eased the suffering of thousands and thousands of people. He's traveled all over Europe teaching and all over the U.S. teaching this stuff, impacting thousands upon thousands of lives. And today we have the opportunity to really learn from some Dr. Robert. I don't know what more to say right now. I can talk more, but thank wow. you so much for joining us <laughs> yeah. and taking time out of your busy schedule 
to be here with us and sharing what you're what you're learning. And I'd love for you to just share. Like he's also the founder of the Destination Method, and I could I could read a whole list of things that he's able to transform: fear, anxiety, weight loss, smoking, uh, crappy marriages, crappy relationships, like the way you see yourself, getting rid of food allergies. Like there's all kinds of things he's able to clear with the modalities of a, applying neuro linguistic programming, applying hypnotherapy techniques, applying what he even created in his own lifetime now called the Destination Method, which is in incorporating the heart and the sword, incorporating all the modalities of NLP, but also the spirituality that, that like the church teaches essentially and putting the two together so true lifetime transformation can occur in all of our lives. And, and, and it's amazing because I've actually done the work myself now since January. And we're doing not just an hour a week, we're spending anywhere from four to eight hours. Some weeks we've done 10 or 12 hours in a week of clearing my own things. And I want to go through layers after layers of layers in my own life. How do I get the results? How do I get the transformation to achieve that which I want so I can live in a better life, so I can encourage and be encouraged more in my life, so I can impact all the people's lives around me and my company and those I actually come into touch with. So. Wow. That's a long intro. I'm, I'm really Because touched. like, like oh. it's just great having How you. Like I don't know more to say. Like, How beautiful. It's awesome. Like and I'm super stoked that we're starting this series. Yeah. And and, so and diving deep into some of these concepts. Yeah. So when you try to teach and I I guess we should where should we start out? But I almost want to go back to the beginning. Sure. How how you started in this world. I guess first a foundational method, right? Sure. Of like what motivated you to get into all this and what were the first areas you started studying and learning? that brought you over the last 50 years to this point where, I mean, transformation just happens around you like this. I mean, it's yeah. at the deepest level. Well, I, I, first of all, I'm really grateful to be here. It, it, it's wonderful. I'm so glad, that, Troy, that you invited me and we get a chance to talk. And then also seeing you in action, giving, providing your enthusiasm and power and strength to something that you really believe in, that really touches me because it's so authentic. So I'm, I'm grateful personally to be here and I'm touched by your authenticity and your strength and power. And you asked me about, about me, I'm, I'm glad to answer actually that question and any question that you might have. But it's true, uh, for more than 50 years I've been doing workshops and communication skills under uh, methods with people. Mm -hmm. And I have taught worldwide, uh, United States and Europe and South America and Asia, China and uh, Japan and down in Australia and New Zealand and all that. And all of that comes from my desire to heal and be healed. I have a mission in life. There are goals in life. I have, I have goals, of course, like anybody has a goal. I have a goal today to do a good job here with you to explain what it is that's going on. Mm -hmm. I have a certain goals that go, yeah, that, that's important to me. But beyond goals, a goal is a limited thing. You get the goal and then you're done. But beyond goals is mission. And mission doesn't end. I discovered my mission long ago. A mission is not something that people actually um, uh, determine, they detect it. It's already in them. And So yes. this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Let me stop you right there. Mm -hmm. A mission is not something that's determined, mm -hmm. it's detected. It's detected. It's a natural. A mission is detected. Yeah, it's, it's not a, something that you try to just manifest or try to create. It's already it's there. It's like it's there and you just detect it. I detect it. it. I go, oh, I notice it. Like we went through this. I mean, sure. What's our mission? Yes, it, what I notice about my mission is it is it's not a one-way street. It's to heal and be healed. Mine's to encourage and be encouraged. Precisely, and, it's, and how do you know that it's, that's your mission? You detected it. Mm -hmm. You detected it over paying attention to your life. Mm -hmm. Well, what have I been doing all the time that I would do for free? Mm -hmm. B because it's my natural destiny. My, yes. a, a mission is like a destiny, it's like a calling. And I'm called to do that. I'm called to heal and to be healed, and, that, and that's been since the time I was a little, a little boy. I remember when I was about three and a half years old, my mother left me um, at, a, at a place with a lot of kids around that age, three and a half, four years old, and she left me there to go because she had to go to work, so it was, it was a, like a nursing place. And all of these kids were there, and I was walking around meeting them. Uh, but I knew the setup. I could, I could understand the setup, that my mom would go away, she'd come back later on in the day and she'd pick me up. And uh, this one day I was, I was there uh, in, out in the playground area and I was in a sandbox and I was playing with the sand and I was playing with a little wooden train, right? And I was moving this wooden train through the sandbox and I looked through the chain link fence and there was a car that had pulled up and, uh, and I started hearing this little girl screaming. 
before she got out of the car. And the mom picked the little girl up and brought her all the way around through the entrance. And she screamed the whole distance. The mom mm -hmm. dropped her off and left. And the little girl ran near me and got a hold of the chain link fence to look at her mom. And her mom was driving away. Mm -hmm. And she was absolutely horrified by what had happened. And I was playing with my train and I waited a while and I waited a while and she didn't calm down. And so I went over to her and I stood next to her for a while. I just stood next to her. We're both at the fence and I was breathing along with her and connecting with her at some level that I didn't understand. And then she turned and looked at me and I said, uh, you know, they, they come back. And as soon as I said that, she stopped crying. Mm. She needed yeah. this information to resolve her suffering. She didn't know. What did she know? She'd never been there before. Yeah. And so I went back to my sandbox. She came over and she starts playing in the sandbox too. That's a very early memory of mine. It's a very powerful memory of mine mm -hmm. because it was, I wasn't trained to do that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trained to explain things to anybody or Correct. help uh, resolve their suffering. But, but my whole life has been that, which yes. is to, to help resolve unnecessary suffering so as to heal mm -hmm. others and be healed by others. Correct. I'm not, I'm not able to do everything by myself. I don't have these fantasies of I'm in charge of the whole world. It's not so. Mm -hmm. I need assistance in knowing things that are out of my awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, if some, something's bothering me and I don't know what it is, so I'll talk to people who are brilliant at noticing that. Mm -hmm. So it's to heal and to be healed. And so that's a, an early memory. And from that whole time, uh, uh, throughout my life, I've had that sort of theme going on. And then, of course, I was raised in an, an alcoholic, abusive, it was quite an uh, abusive family in terms of the verbal abuse that was going on. And there was some physical, uh, but my uh, father was uh, profoundly alcoholic. And all, in fact, all the male McDonald's that I knew, they were all mm -hmm. alcoholic. Uh, and so my uncles and all of that. But my, uh, my father then, a deeply depressed uh, person, mm -hmm. uh, struggled with uh, depression his whole life. He committed suicide by the time I was 27. Well, during that time of being raised in an alcoholic family that had uh, verbal, my brother was bigger and stronger and older than I, and he was brutal. He mm -hmm. was really brutal when I was growing up. So I had to deal with the aggress being aggressed upon. And how do I handle that? What do I do to, ha to handle that? I, I, I just received it for years and years and felt bad about it. But I also thought, what can be done about this? And, what, and it was an interesting thing with my brother. When I eventually stopped him, I was about 17 years old, when I eventually stopped him from harming me, I stopped him because he started to beat me up and instead I stopped him and, and almost beat him up, got ready, got close to doing that, and he couldn't fight me. An interesting thing, when I left his presence, I went out in the backyard realizing that I had stopped him from doing something he'd done his whole life. And I began to cry because he didn't have me to beat up anymore. Yeah. I was really aware that he felt so bad about himself that he needed to do something he thought was going to make him feel good, like dominate somebody else. It never worked. He never felt better by doing that. Yeah. But when I cried, it was like, oh my goodness, what's he going to do now? So I had that kind of empathy that oftentimes comes from living in a family like that. I had a lot of empathy for people's feelings and, and their experience and stuff, put myself in their shoes. But then I had to struggle with how do I get out of their shoes? And I think a dominant problem throughout the nation today mm -hmm. has to do with what we're calling the great opioid addiction problem throughout the United States. Addiction comes from a, uh, the, uh, the problem of being, of confusing one's identity with something else. So when I confused my identity with other people's suffering, I didn't know how to stop suffering if they were suffering. That's so deep. You know, if I, if I don't know how to stop, they're suffering and I want to help, right? Uh -huh. But I can't help them if, if their suffering is, is felt as mine. Mm -hmm. A little bit of that is a really good idea called empathy. But, 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 but you know, if, if, I, if I'm unable, if they're unable to solve it and I'm unable to solve it, then I feel as bad as they do forever. This is a real serious problem. It is called codependence. Codependence. Codependence is a confusion of identities. Who yes. am I? And here I was growing up in a family that taught codependence. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I was. My father was alcoholic. I was co-alcoholic or codependent with my father, codependent with my mother. And so I confused my identities. Mm -hmm. And it took me years yeah. to figure that out. And How then, long? I mean, like, so you're experiencing this as 17 with your brother. Yeah. You've grown up with these experiences. You're defining, you're detecting 
your mission My in mission, life, right. but you had these natural inclinations mm -hmm. that were that were showing up through empathy. You started mm -hmm. having these revelations of like, oh my God, if my brother can't beat me up anymore, he doesn't have anyone to beat up and try to feel better about himself. You're having these revelations. So at what age did you really start? It wasn't until I understood. How to all this. It wasn't until I, uh, I was reading William Glasser's uh, work, Reality Therapy, was done in the fifties, but. I wasn't until William Glasser, and then out of William Glasser came Neuro Linguistic Programming. NLP was created by Richard Bandler and John Grinder, a couple of geniuses who understood how the mind works very, very well. But mm -hmm. they, they knew about Glasser's work, and they knew about Virginia Satir's work. And the foundation of Glasser and Virginia Satir was that everybody has a positive intention. Mm -hmm. Everybody's doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. Everybody. They may get lousy results, but they think that that method is going to work. I love that. Right? Yeah. But so, so what happened is it wasn't until I read uh, Glasser and Satir and then NLP came along. Richard and John named it NLP in 1976, mm. right? So yeah. prior to 76, they were doing a lot. Uh, but they named it Neuro Linguistic Programming in 1976. And uh, they had these wonderful tools right out of the bat. Right, but immediately they could do it. Go, wow, what were they doing? They were helping to resolve painful memories yeah. very quickly. Yeah. I was going, wow, how do you do that? And they presumed positive intent. They didn't believe in positive uh -huh. intent, but they presumed positive intent. And since yeah. that resonated with me from my own upbringing, because, yeah. see, I saw the positive intent of my brother. Yeah. I went, well, well he's, he's just trying to feel good about himself yeah. at my expense. Yeah. Right? But it didn't help me because I didn't have the rest of the story which NLP provided. So mm -hmm. this is what you mentioned when, in talking about me, yeah. the heart and the sword. The heart of compassion is yeah. absolutely necessary for a happy life. Yes. But the heart of the, if all I have is compassion and I don't have any method to, to make a change, yeah. then what happens is I'm lost in compassion. I, I watch somebody has a broken leg and I go, wow, I really feel bad for you, but uh -huh. I have no method to help them set the leg. Yeah. And so I need the sword of technology. I need step-by-step -step procedures to help resolve suffering. So what I understood very early on is I needed to have an integration of the heart of compassion and the sword of technology. This is where the destination method came up. From, so, that's right. So, again, you're how old are you now when you're running across? So you went in the military. Yeah, I was in the you army. You went to college. In the Vietnam War, yeah. You were in the Vietnam War. I got out. Uh, I got I got out to see in '69. So by by '70 mm. by '75 '76, I was already. Um, had a lot of that understanding, but it took and it took through in 19. So you saw immense suffering in the Vietnam War too. You yeah. saw suffering in your well, family. I wasn't in the country of Vietnam. Uh -huh. I I was in the army, and I was supposed to go to Vietnam uh -huh. for through those three years, but I kept not going there. God was working something out for me, so I could. I'm pretty sure I'd be dead if I went to Vietnam. <laughs> so, so what I what I was able to. Uh, I'm very very grateful yeah. for that, for the opportunity to be able to be of service in some way. Yeah. And it comes because I didn't die in the Vietnam War, but uh, I, w I, wanted to, I wanted to make m major changes. So by, by the end of the 70s, mm -hmm. by like 1979, 1980, a book called Frogs and the Princess came out by Stephen, Connie, Ray, Andreas, uh, who were editing for uh, Frogs Richard and the John. Frogs and the Princess. When I read that, I went, this is telling me everything I already know. I went Frogs this and the princess. into, into princes. Turning frogs a frog, princess, turning a frog it. into a princess, prince into a prince, prince into frogs a prince. and a prince, princes, and so okay. I, I went, wow, if this is true, mm -hmm. because it made a lot of amazing claims, like yeah. we can resolve traumatic memories, we can yeah. resolve shock, and and I was going, mm. but what if it's true? What if it's true? Yeah. So what I have in common with you is I'm endlessly curious. Mm -hmm. I don't stop being curious, no. and I'm, re I'm ready to question my own beliefs, and I'm ready to question, well, does this Correct. work or does it not work? So yeah. when I read the book, I went, wow, this doesn't, how is it possible? How can they do it? I had already had a master's degree in counseling and mental health. I was already wow. uh, very powerful in that world, uh -huh. but I couldn't resolve a traumatic memory in one session because I didn't have the tools, right? I didn't have the sword. I had a lot of heart but I didn't have enough of the sword. So what NLP provided me with was this astonishingly sharp sword. This, uh, these techniques. Techniques, methodologies. Uh -huh. And then I said, but what I noticed is NLP has and had and still has uh -huh. 
amazingly powerful uh, tools. Uh -huh. What it doesn't have is an insistence on the heart, mm. on a, a moral compass. It doesn't have that. Yeah. So anybody can learn NLP and they can maneuver people and change their own lives. And they can do it with a, a consciousness that ha that's, that's dull, a consciousness yeah. that's has negative intent. They can they can create evil in the world. There's a lot of people using NLP for bad purposes, right? It's true, now. I think. For picking up girls to you've had NLP coaches yeah, yeah. that have never practiced. Yeah, they don't. Like with this guy, you know, uh, this is one guy that we know, he's got coaches now teaching his stuff. Mm. These coaches that never coaches and they're training coaches to go right. do it and practitioners never practice. Yeah. And it's and it's and it's diluted this amazing That's right. work. That's when I found you. Yeah. I was shocked that yeah, like, but since him, like, he was amazing at NLP. This other guy, this other yeah. guy, um, but but he charted ridiculous prices, and he and like, and to work with him was very hard. And there's very few people actually practice this stuff. Very and few. And if more people practice it, it would be truly life changing for this nation. That's right. I mean, tr like, so much trauma, so much, so many like NLP for those who actually really practice it. They've read all the books, like not just one book, not just one seven day course, not just one thirty day quote unquote mastery course. From the water down to loot itself, but people that are doing this day in, day out, five, six, eight hours a day, five, six, seven days a week, for year in, year out, decade in, decade out, those are the people that are creating true transformation in people's lives. Mm. And there's a lot of people that are selling a lot of hype that true. you are not. Well, You've no. done the work, um, you're applying this stuff. Yeah, well, I, uh, like yeah. I, learned, I learned a long time ago that I couldn't, uh, I, I could not feel uh, congruent if I'm teaching NLP, uh, people how to be a practitioner, a master uh -huh. practitioner, a trainer of NLP, and, I haven't, and I'm unable to work with individual clients and couples and families. I learned a long time ago, I went, wait a minute, no, yeah. I must always have private practice. I must always do that. And so all these years I see individuals, couples, families, and I see them and help them utilizing these tools that I learned uh, out of the world of NLP. I also created a lot of those tools in NLP. But that allows me, when I'm, when I'm teaching a class, if I teach somebody how to do what I'm doing, and that's what I, I do teach how, how to do what I'm doing, when I do that, I want to be sure that it's authentic. Mm. And, and so I'm yeah. not just teaching them, okay, here, try, this is, a, this is a tool, and then they don't actually work with somebody. I won't certify somebody unless they know what they're doing. Yeah. And, that, and that's crucial, and I'm, I'm disappointed with much of what's out today that passes for NLP, yeah. when really it's just a, here's another tool, another tool, without the, the person having the, Im, the impact of working with a human being, mm -hmm. working with a person who needs assistance, and how do you do that? with? The big question in teaching NLP is, how do you utilize these astonishing tools with somebody who knows nothing about their mind, never heard they had a mind? How do you do that? How do you bring them up to speed yeah. so that they can make a change? That's a yeah. big problem. Well, I have had to deal with that my entire career. And so consequently, when I'm teaching a class of people becoming practitioners, I know what works. Yeah. I know precisely what works and what doesn't work yeah. in the world of NLP. Because you're constantly trying, you're constantly testing, Always. you're constantly Always. evolving, and then you've did the work. So all through the 70s, yeah. you actually had a master's degree in counseling. A master of science in counseling and mental health. Uh, I, first I had a bachelor's degree in, count, in psychology uh -huh. you know, in 1972, and then by, it was about 1980, so I got a master of science in counseling and mental health. And you were running men's groups in the 70s, oh, too. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, I started the first men's groups that I ever heard about. This is about 1971. Uh -huh. 1971, I was, uh, I was in Chico, California, and I, and, and I was married at the time to a woman who was very much involved with the women's movement. And I said, uh -huh. well, this would be a great thing to have a men's movement. Yeah, why didn't How about that? Very, yeah like those are men's groups. And I found out that no, not very many people were interested in that. Uh, so I had to start explaining about mm. the hazards of being male. There's a wonderful book called The Hazards of Being Male by a guy named Bo Goldberg. And uh, I had to start explaining the hazards of being male. And maybe it's a good idea to have a lot of men get together and talk openly and honestly and transparently. Yeah. All, all of my early psychology work was all heart. It didn't yeah. have any sword. It was all heart. And so I was very happy to be in that. Heart is like place. sharing emotions, yep. what's going on, yep. what we do, yep. talking through feelings. Yep. So when you mean sword, sword is a very specific modality mm -hmm. to create a very specific result. Right. So the sword could be a small knife to just cut your vegetables or right. another knife that actually cuts meat. Yeah, exactly. And it's like specifically the right tool for their, one's a screwdriver with a mm -hmm. flathead, the mm -hmm. other one's a screwdriver with a Phillips head. That's precisely and, right. And the, and the sword is specifically these different tools at the right moment 
to be able to go into someone's life and say, okay, you've got this problem with this set of tools, I can fix this. Precisely. I can transform this to what you want it to be. You've got to be clear on where you want to go and what do you want to release? Do you want to release this allergy or not? Do you want to release this old belief that's holding you back or not? Or do you want to keep that belief? Because that belief is serving you in some capacity. Mm -hmm. and that's what the sort is, different modalities, different methods, different techniques to basically take someone from from whatever they're at right now to wherever they need to go Precisely. or want to go or choose to go. Precisely, one of the gra so. greatest, uh, there are many, many, many NLP swords or these precision tools. Uh, for example, somebody has an internal negative dialogue, they're talking to themselves and they keep telling themselves things that feel really bad. Yeah. They say, well, I'm no good, I'm a shit, uh, you know, I can't do it, there's something wrong with me. Or they have the three, the three negative uh, beliefs. The three belief barriers are, uh, helpless, hopeless, and worthless. So a person goes, oh, I'm helpless, I'm helpless, or I'm hopeless, I can't do it, or I'm worthless, I could do it, but I don't deserve it. And they have this negative internal dialogue. Oftentimes negative internal dialogue will, sound, will start with, well, what if this happens? It creates a lot of anxiety. What if I lose yeah. everything? What if I'm just on the street? What if, what if I fail at this? And then they have anxiety from that, and they have negative self-esteem. It's really very, very common to have a negative judge in the mind. Yeah. Well, NLP developed uh, this tool called the Auditory Swish, which Connie Ray Andreas out in Colorado uh, formalized, and yeah. she's a genius. Yeah. Um, Steve and Connie Ray, a couple of geniuses. Steve and Connie Ray Andreas. So Steve and Connie Ray, Ray Andreas. Andreas. Yeah. A N D R E A S. That's right. Got it. And they're they're still practicing. No, uh, Steve recently passed away. Oh, he well. he's about 83 years old when he died just wow. recently, last um, few months ago. Uh, an absolute genius at uh, at NLP, and his wife uh, Connie Ray as well. Well, Connie Ray formalized the auditory switch process, and mm -hmm. uh, somebody comes to me and they go, "I'd like to be able to solve." this negative thing. I get up in the morning and I hear negativity in my own head or in my mind or I feel it in my body. What do I do? And they don't know what to like do. Like I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm fat, I'm ugly, yes, I can't right. succeed in my business, I'm, yeah. I am I, I don't have the skills Tony Robbins has or I can't yep. build a company like That's this right. person or I'm never gonna find the love of my life. That's I'm not right. good enough to have a person All do. of those. I'm a crappy parent, whatever it all is. All of those Got and it. more. All, it's, all, it's all negative internal commentary. Mm -hmm. So here's this negative, inter that's called an inner critic. Mm -hmm. Well, an inner critic is simply a habit that the person's mind has gotten into mm -hmm. and what's needed is a tool, a method, a precision tool mm -hmm. to transform that negative into a positive. Yes. So instead of uh, trying to, to cancel out the negative, it's allow the negative to be the springboard to the positive. Mm -hmm. So that when the negative comes up that says something like, oh, I'm a shit, I'm, I'm stupid. I'm stupid. I'm really stupid. There's something wrong with me. I, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll never be a success. Da, 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 it starts with the word I. Mm -hmm. Well, that sentence needs to be the springboard to transform to another sentence that says, I feel good about myself or I feel safe. So that instead of trying to eliminate the problem, we use the problem as the, the catalyst mm -hmm. to, to bring about something better. So there's never a war inside. Let me yes. explain why. If I have uh, I'm no good, and then I keep telling myself I am good, I'm no good, I am good. Then that creates an inner conflict. Correct. It's just a fight, and you have to, and you have to work really hard and, and sweat. And these two different belief systems or yeah. two different convictions yeah, fighting, are fighting, fighting and, yeah. and you you can't move. You, you're immobilized. I'm no good. I am good. I'm, I'm no immobilized. Good, I, I'm not going to take action. I'm immobilized. All conflict leads to immobilization and fatigue. Mm -hmm. I've worked with a lot of people with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and mm -hmm. all that. Invariably, I found that it has to do with an underlying structure of conflict. Well, when there's a conflict like that, mm -hmm. I'm no good, I am good, it's like, why not use the I'm no good, I'm worthless, mm -hmm. to be the springboard to produce I am good? Yes. Why not have that? Then you're not fighting inside. Correct. And so this is the brilliance of neurolinguistic programming. And this is your camera too, by the way. If you ever want to talk directly oh, okay. to the audience, this one's right on your face. Okay. That one's right on my face, and this is the wide camera you can always look at if you want to explain right. anything in depth Thanks. to the audience. I, I'll remember. Yeah, so it's um, uh, it's wonderful to have tools like like my wife Luzette and I, what we do is we, we teach classes so that people can have all the tools they need to resolve their life issues, whatever life issue they have, whether it's shock, trauma, mm -hmm. grief, internal conflict, negative commentary, mm -hmm. codependence, addiction. We have tools that address all of that. The only thing that people need, 
uh, that we, we have all those things. What do they need to bring? They uh -huh. need to bring that they want a change. Yes. That they're authentic, that they want a so change. Number one, they actually truly want a change. Yep, because my metaphor for the destination method is that I'm like a taxi driver. So yes. I'm like a taxi driver, what does that yes. mean? I, I used to you know, get out of, a, out of an airplane in Copenhagen and I'd get in the taxi in Copenhagen or London or wherever I was, mm -hmm. and taxi drivers around the world, they all say the same thing. Where do you want to go? go? Where do you want to go? They never yes. say uh, like, okay, so you're here now, give me some money. They say, where do you want to go? And so if, yeah. if I am a taxi driver and, and my clients are passengers, mm -hmm. I don't know where they want to go. Mm -hmm. They have to know it and they have Correct. to want to go there. So I, I sort out a lot of people on the phone when they call me up and say, I'd like to come see you. I go, well, what do you want? And they go, I don't know. My, my mother told me I should see you or my, or my wife or my husband. Or, uh -huh. And I go, well, what, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And they go, I don't want anything. Well, then it's a waste of time and money to come see me. Yes. You know, I, say, I won't do that. I, I won't do that thing that lacks a moral compass. I won't charge them money for something I know they're not going to get anything. So yeah. when they tell me, oh, you know what I want? I want this. I say, okay. They might even say, I don't know what I want, but I want to know what I want. That's okay. That'll yes, work. Yes, yes, yes. Because they actually want something. Correct. I want to know what I want. I'd like I to. I want to know what I want. Yeah, yes. that'll work. So they come in and we get the chance to explore because our, our work is exploration, understanding, and action. Exploration, to explore where we are in relation to where we want to go is understanding. Exploration. Understanding. Understanding. And action. And action. Yeah. The exploration part mm -hmm. is we explore, I explore with the client, mm -hmm. where, where are you now? And when we understand the difference between where the client is and where the client wants to go, that's called understanding. Yeah. I understand now. Oh, I'm here and I want to go there. And then the next step is action. Take the action to get them from where they are to where they want to go. Same with a taxi. Person says to me, I want to go certain place. Then we go, okay, now we know you're here and you want to go there. Let's take the action, okay? Mm -hmm. But So what works best is when the client is open to explore their true desire. What do you like, really want? At all? Yeah. Like what do you you're want? you're here for a reason, you're yeah. here like what is it that, what was deep inside you that you really want? Like you're, if someone's showing up for your work, they're gonna really have something else. They may have an issue they start with, mm -hmm. but underneath there's more. They And yeah. a lot of times most of us don't even know sure. what, how we're even programmed. We're unconsciously incompetent. Yeah, unconscious and I love that pyramid. Mm -hmm. Unconsciously incompetent that we become consciously incompetent. We, under, we discover mm -hmm. that, oh my God, I am being codependent. I am enabling people as a leader. I yes. am enabling uh, relationships. I am. I am becoming codependent with dysfunctional people in my life or mm -hmm. by trying to save everybody. And these are some of the revelations that I've even got by working with Dr. Robert and, and on using these modalities on me, releasing past behaviors. And, and the process is super in depth. I mean, the, the, it's not something that you can just take a weekend course and learn NLP or a seven day course that'll apply. You've got to really spend decades of your life to have these nuances to get the real transformation to be able to guide people through processes and know what to do and what sequence so you don't screw their life up. And that's why the destination method too has the heart aspect, mm -hmm. has the spiritual side, the love side, the caring side, because if you just do the surgical side, you mm -hmm. just do the practical mechanical side, you're, you're not gonna get to the level wow. of, of true transformation in a positive way that's like truly like life-changing. I mean, well, yeah, like like in, a, in a way that's, that's like, right. I don't have to describe like really heart centered, like it's ground. It's like, we're, we're not just using NLP to pick up girls. Cause there, there are the pickup artists sure. that have taken NLP just for that. So girls think this guy's being nice to them or they're in love when they're not. just so the guy can hook up with them. And there's a lot of that happening in LA. Like there's, they have all the pickup artists mm -hmm. and all the courses mm -hmm. and everything else. Mm -hmm. And then there's other people that are just using NLP in sales to rip people off, to mm -hmm. screw people out of their money. Mm -hmm. That's not the other purpose either. Like this is for people that really have real suffering or want true change or really want to become the next best version of themselves mm -hmm. at the highest level. And that's where, that's what I really love about it. Well, it's true. And I, the way that I explain that is that, let's say that I, I, I don't have any heart at all. I have a sword. I have the method. Mm -hmm. uh, I then can achieve anything I want. Mm -hmm. A sword can be used to cut fruit from a tree and serve your neighbor. Yeah. It also can be used to stab your neighbor. So that you say, I have, a, I have this sword and I'm gonna set a goal and I'm gonna get the goal. The sword mm -hmm. will pr provide that. Yeah. But here's the problem. If I have no heart, yeah. 
at all. No empathy, no You're moral compass. No, I will get what it is I want and it will end up meaningless. Yeah. Meaninglessness yes. occurs because heart is the foundation of meaning. Mm. The heart is that which has to do with love, compassion, yes. understanding, and context. You can't have meaning without context. Yeah. So I go, okay, I want to get that and I'm going to go for it. And then I get it and I get it and I get it and I go, why is my life feeling empty and meaningless when I got everything that I set out yes. to get? You've got, you have the life, you got the wife, yeah. the kids, whatever. I mean, everyone's in these different places where they get what they want and all of a sudden like, I go, what's, well, what's going on? Like, why, why does this, great big hole. it feels great as I thought. You great know? hole, great big hole I built this person. company out of nowhere. That's right. And also have this company and like, I don't feel good about having a company. And people are like, do you feel successful? Like, no. No, in fact, they, they feel, well, yeah, technically I'm successful, but the fact of the matter is that I feel empty. It, 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 the question comes, empty. Why, so what? So what? So what? So I managed to have millions and millions. Yes, and so what? That question comes when there's insufficient heart. The heart is necessary. It's, it's typically ignored in courses that are, have to do with success and going forward and achievement. Mm -hmm. It's typically ignored, but if it's ignored, if I have only a, a sword and no heart, I will achieve what I set out to achieve, but in the end, I'll, it'll be em empty and moistureless. It'll be dry. Now, if I only have heart, mm -hmm. I won't be able to get anything predictably. The heart doesn't predictably get me anything. Mm -hmm. It just loves what's there. So I need the heart of compassion and the sword of technology mm -hmm. to integrate to do both, to have both create something new. And what that new level is, is the destination method. The destination method emerged from the in integration of the heart and the sword. It's, it, it has to do with empowered compassion. That's what destination method is, empowered compassion. Empowered compassion. compassion. Yeah, we have compassion. It, would that be the framework or the, the, the connection of the destination method? Nope. Yeah. That's a sign from God to say, we're, gonna, we're gonna focus on the destination That's method. Right wrap up this episode on what is the history of Dr. Robert D. McDonald, what he went through is, is the suffering of a child mm -hmm. and the experiences he had as a young adult. Mm -hmm. And then he, then his own desire, his own detection of his mission. Mm -hmm. So he'd live out his mission to ease the suffering of this world. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. To ease the suffering of this world. It's a resolution it's, of unnecessary and, uh, suffering. You detected that mission from these stories he was telling us. And then we hear, then we just heard about basically what he went through. He got the undergrad, the masters, he started these men's groups, he started doing this other life and trying to apply this and teach people. And he realized you only had the heart. He wasn't able to get the, the true death until he discovered and stumbled upon through different books by different people. He was meeting up in Northern California at the time. There were the, the, this group of people, this amalgamy of people that were kind of on this mission to say, how do we create true, lasting, deep transformation? And how do we get it fast? And people started watching different people, what they were doing. But Junior Satir had a very specific method that other people would come and watch and go, Oh, that's how she's getting her result. She's building rapport mm -hmm, with the patient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She's in alignment. She's in agreement. And, and she's able from that rapport, create true transformation. And, and these experiences that Robert was, was, was collecting and developing created this guy now that we're, we're from 80, 90, 2000, 2000, it's 40 years mm -hmm. of, of true application of NLP. Yeah. And in that process, he's like, oh, NLP only does like a, like a surgical knife, but there's no meaning, there's no heart, there's no depth to it. And no. what Robert, Dr. Robert has done is like, okay, well, what else is missing? Because every technique, catch this, don't miss this guys. Every technique, every psychological level of, 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 the, of the human race, discovering who they are, what we are, and what we are made up. It was generation after generation, standing on the shoulders of each other, this educational process from Aristotle till now. Mm -hmm. We've been walking through this process together. We've been trying to discover like, who are we as humans? How are we made? How do we, how do we go to this next life? And that's what the destination method is now. It's a new evolution of what NLP used to be. And it's a new evolution of a deep practice, very precise, not like the current junk that's currently going on, on, oh, get certified in NLP, and you can have a certificate and take a picture with somebody who's never lived it themselves, never done the work on other people really, and not getting the deep transformation, and truly taking the techniques to the highest level to truly 
ease the suffering, create the transformation that would help so many millions upon billions of people. Because all of us, no matter who we are, we are not immune to the sadness. We are not immune to the to the emotional trauma and the, mm -hmm. and the emotional roller coasters we go through in this life. And that's where these techniques are so valuable. Yeah. And, and I'm grateful that you created this technique. Yeah. I think we should wrap this episode up today. Fine. And we'll shoot the second one yeah. after this. And um, so we break these up in chunks so people can okay. watch this and digest bits and pieces. We can write this out below. There's gonna be links on, on, on this video for where you need to go to find out more information about Dr. Robert D. McDonald and some of the things he's doing. He's got tons of courses online and we're gonna bring you links and help you find these courses that you can buy to apply these things to your life where if you get access to him and can afford him, or you can, and all you can do is just get the audios. You can listen to these things. The method works, the systematic process works. And that's the beauty of this thing. It is a science-based process of, tra of creating true transformation in our lives and a step-by-step -step process that you can even do on yourself a lot of times. It's true. It's and he's got a lot of modalities. And like, it's like almost giving the secrets to your mind, guys like the secrets to unlocking your greatest potential in life and releasing the crap that's holding you back. And that's what Dr. Robert D. McDonald has created with the Destination Method. And we'll send links to the, the courses. Sure. Here I got Sage Advice of One. I've got Heal the Inner Critic, which I've got a lot of inner critic in me. Like I tell myself how, how bad I am at this, how bad am I at that, I need to prove on this. I mean, constant inner critic mm -hmm. going on in my head and I'm sure you can experience the same thing. So thank you very much thank for the show. We'll break it up into the next one. That's and great. We'll, we'll go to part two down the road here. Thank you. Thank you guys.